book of Judges tonight. Last week we talked about there in chapter four, um, one of the most, one of the strangest stories in the Bible, and you're going to learn some things here as we study the book of Judges uh, that you would never hear on TV. And I'm not saying that because we no more. I'm just saying that because uh, we teach the Bible just like it is, all of it, and not just the prosperity healing parts, um, the Bible. Now, tonight, you're going to see some things in the Bible. It may not be quite as exciting as last week. Man, we had that one there near last week and snuck in on that man and caught him laying down there and put that nail through his head. That's some excitement drama there, buddy. I mean, that's a thriller for, for, for TV. That put a Lifetime movie out of, out of business. She caught him asleep, took that nail about that long, put it right down on his head, and bam, right through it. Jail was her name. Jail had the nail and got rid of Sisera. And Sisera was a picture and type of the Antichrist. Now, I want to say this as we look at chapter 5. The way you under, get something out of the Bible, the Bible's a dull book until you know the author when you're saved and until you understand the different applications of Scripture. In other words, if you just picked up the Old Testament and read it, you'd say, what in the world? All it says is wars and famines and disease and killing. And, all that. and it's a history of one nation, Israel, basically what it is, and kings and kingdoms. Who's going to rule? Who's going to run who? Who's going to be the boss? And, but once you get saved and you understand prophecy, then it starts unraveling. And so tonight, this is a song. The whole chapter of chapter 5, 31 verses, is a song that Deborah wrote after they had won the victory, set Israel free, and this was so big of a victory that Israel had rest 40 years after it. So that, that must have been some kind of victory. When she killed that guy, bam, the enemy went down, God was back on the throne, great revival, and Israel had peace and rest for 40 years. So tonight, you cannot make light of this song. Now, before we read it, I want to tell you something else, too. Your King James Bible has this in here, just like all the rest of it. You see how chapter 5 looks like chapter 4 in your Bible? It don't do that in the New Bibles. The New Bibles take all this stuff like this and put it in poetry form so you won't take it seriously and as, a, as a doctrine. You watch the NIV, you watch the New Bibles, they always put the Psalms and, and uh, Song of Solomon and stuff like it's, some, like it's poetic. Like it's just Deborah singing a song. We won. We won uh, the victory. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. This is scripture just like everything else in the Bible. There's probably a thousand songs back in them days. And God chose this one to put in the Bible. Now what you're going to see in this one, it is absolutely full of prophecy on the second coming, especially the second advent of Christ, the tribulation and the antichrist. Sisera is a type of the Antichrist. Deborah uh, is a prophetess, and Barak would be a type of Jesus Christ in this story tonight. So let's look at it with that in mind. Chapter 5, verse 1. Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. Now, uh, Deborah is a prophetess, as the Bible tells her in that last verse, and so she's prophesying here. And Barak, the type of Christ, this is a victory song connected with a woman. And I told you last week, it's not an accident that she took her right hand, and we talked, studied about left-handed stuff in the Bible, she took her right hand and nailed that guy and that's not the only time in the Bible when a woman kills somebody to type of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist has a wound in the head. That's why, that's why you see that darkened right eye. That's why all this stuff, the Illuminati, all these rappers and rocks cover that one eye. He's going to have a strong right eye and a weak left eye. 
and a strong right arm and a, and a weak left arm. I'm sorry, the other way around. Strong left eye, strong left arm, str- weak right eye and weak right arm, according to Zechariah chapter 11, the Antichrist. So it's not just Sisera. This is a picture of the end of the tribulation. Now, if a woman gets to nail the Antichrist, or Sisera in this case, and um, the other guy over there that we talked about last week, uh, the, one, uh, the woman who, uh, what was that other one? Abimelech, yeah. He's a picture of the Antichrist, and the woman killed him. Then if this is a picture of the end of the tribulation, when the Lord comes back, who's the woman he's got with us, with him? Us, the church. And who's the woman in the tribulation? Israel. So there's no doubt about it. Prophetically, this is teaching that Israel will one day help kick the Antichrist out and, and maybe even us as a church. But it'll definitely be a uh, picture by the woman. It's not accident. Don't forget, there's not an accident in this book. Don't forget that. This is a supernatural book. There's millions of incidents took place back then. And God chose that one to put in the Bible. All right? Verse 2. Praise the Lord for avenging of Israel. This is what they'll sing at the end of the tribulation. The willing offer. Verse 3. Hear, O ye kings. Notice that? See that? Multiple. Plural. There wasn't, the, there wasn't kings there in this battle. There was one king, Jabin. So it's prophetic. It's not just talking about that battle. And if you read the Bible, you'll see this over and over. Sometimes they'll just be talking and talking, and their talk jumps thousands of years ahead of time. How many of you have ever seen that in your Bible? Raise your hand. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Like, look at Isaiah 53, that chapter on the, on the uh, he's talking about stuff that's really going on, and all of a sudden he just starts saying, you'll be bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, that's an obvious obvious prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the way that Old Testament's written, it's written for here, now, what's going on now, and also for way out yonder in the future somewhere called double application and sometimes triple. Every verse in the Bible has a literal meaning. It has a a doctrinal meaning, and it has a prophetic meaning. So in literally, she's talking about jail killing that guy. Prophetically, it's talking about the end of the tribulation and during the tribulation. You'd never think of it. So it says kings, hero king. You know who them kings are? The kings of the east are in Revelation 16. You say, oh, Brother Danny, you're stretching it. You just watch this. Oh, you kings, give ear. I will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the God, Lord God of Israel. Verse 4, Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, that, didn't, that wasn't happening in that battle. The Lord didn't go out of Seir in that battle. Battle, Seir, according to my studies, is over 130 miles from there, south of the Dead Sea. This is another battle he, she's prophesying, like it's already happened. That's another thing you notice about prophecy. Um, you're bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. That hadn't even happened yet. But it said it like it had happened. And that's just what I preach Sunday morning. I preach Sunday morning on God calling those things that are not as though they are. So some, when God says something, it's like it's already happened, but it ain't. But it's just as good as. <laughs> I mean, but when he said it, it's coming through like a freight train. So, uh, seer, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, the heavens dropped, and the clouds dropped water. Now, let me ask you something. Did the earth tremble when she killed that man with that nail? No, it didn't. Don't say it did. This is talking about another time. This song is prophetic, people. The earth tremble. There's going to be a tremendous earthquake at the end of the tribulation. Revelation 16. That's the big one that George Jefferson always talked about. You kids don't remember George Jefferson. I think he always talked about the big one, the big heart attack, the big drama. They, they talk about the big one that's going to get California, the big one that's going to get, the, the big one that's going to get, uh, the big one's coming, buddy. It may be about a 12 or something. I don't know. <laughs> I believe we've already had a big one. That's all them mountains got jerked around up there in the Blue Ridge Mountain. Uh, did I say something wrong? Y'all are laughing at me. Fred Sanford. 
Why did I say George Jefferson? I, I, I thought everybody's going to look at I knew I said so. Fred Sanford, he, he was a funny guy, man, a guy. And he was always, he started, and he said, oh, it's the big one. And, uh, but anyway, this is the big one, buddy. This is the big one. And I'm telling you what, uh, he, uh, it said the heavens dropped, the clouds dropped water. There again, end of the tribulation. How many of y'all know? You've studied it. I've taught the book of Revelation here. At the end of the tribulation, it hadn't rained for three and a half years, like it had Isaiah's prophet, uh, Elijah, three and a half years of drought, and then a flood comes at the end of it. The former and latter rain together come at the end of the tribulation. So it's prophetic. Um, in uh, Revelation 3, there's unclean spirits. The devil is getting... Uh, and, and not in Revelation 3. In Revelation, there are three unclean spirits like frogs. I don't know what chapter it is. I don't know, about halfway, two-thirds of the way full. And it said the devil gathered together the kings of the east to make war against the Lord or against the, and his people. So that's the kings of the east. Uh, Psalm 68 tells you about the battle of Armageddon. Habakkuk 3 and verse 3 is a picture of it. And Elijah and all that stuff is about uh, looking through the lattice, as we'll see in a minute, picture of the second advent. Verse number 5. The mountains melted from before the Lord. Did the mountains melt when she drove that nail in that guy's head? No, sir. That's prophetic. That's prof prophetic. That's going to happen. Mountains are going to melt. From even from that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. There's why it said old Deborah was a prophetess. Son, she was prophesying there, buddy. Up thousands of years ahead of time. You know what? She didn't even know there's going to be a Bible. The people in Judges' time didn't even know that the book of Revelation was ever going to be. They just wrote what they said, and then the other ones wrote what they said, what God said, and, they, and it all comes together and teaches that the kings of the east are going to come together one of these days, and they're going to have a battle at Megiddo, that's Armageddon, and the mountains are going to melt, and they're going to have a big earthquake and a flood, and the whole Bible teaches that. Buddy, I don't know about you, but that makes me know who wrote this book knew the end from the beginning. The one that wrote this book had it all knowledge ahead of time. Uh, prophecy is, is history in advance. Verse number 6. Verse number 6. It'll burn as an oven, see? Verse number 6. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through byways. Isn't that something? That's, that's an interesting verse there. I don't, I don't really know prophetically, I think, I think maybe during the tribulation it'll be so crazy if anybody avoids the tri if anybody avoids the mark of the beast and tries to hide they won't be out in public they won't be out in the highways and the byways I don't know that but I'm sure there will be people trying to hide to keep taking the mark these doomsday preppers and people like that. Yep, it's coming. The fighting on horses is coming on over here. We'll get to it in a minute. I forget which verse it is. Um, verse 7. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel. That didn't happen when she killed that guy with a nail. That's prophetic. It, we're going to until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. Verse 8. See, in verse 7, Jerusalem is just about wiped out. And you know the Bible teaches that during the tribulation, that remnant of the Jews will flee to Petra, probably, that rock city, Judea, flee to the wilderness from the Antichrist, and preachers and missionaries who have been there say that you couldn't put more than two or three thousand, five thousand, ten at the most inside that city. So that means the entire Jewish population will be wiped out during the tribulation except for several thousand. That's God. They said, His blood be on us and on our children. And buddy, it's coming. What Hitler did in the Holocaust is, is nothing like what's coming in the tribulation. Those Jews, man, it, it breaks your heart for them. I mean, they're blinded. They rejected their Savior. And God said, all right. 
All right. You got you want blood? You're going to get blood. And that's what they said. His blood be on us and on our children. And the Lord says, all right. And it's coming. The worst time the world has ever seen is coming during the Great Tribulation. Uh, now, all right, here we go. Verse number eight, they chose new gods. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Man, when I seen that studying, I wanted to preach on it. They chose new gods, little g. Is that a picture of our country or what? Israel chose new gods, fallen false gods. America tonight has definitely chose new gods. Amen. Lord have mercy. I was thinking about sports today. And, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Dax, uh, uh, Carrie was texting me. And, and I mean, they go to church. They went, they're at church tonight. They're having church tonight. That's good. And I fuss at them for doing it because I think they'll be here. And, but they're at church tonight and everything, but I'm telling you, our country has made a God out of sports, people. I mean, I, I like, you know me, I like basketball. I enjoy it. I love it for relaxation, for fun, for exercise. But I'm telling you, I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw my Bible down and, and, and miss church. And they, they, I, I heard that out in Dallas, Texas, when the Cowboys are playing, that church is all over Dallas. They let out at 1130 because people pitch a fit if, the, if they miss the kickoff of a Dallas Cowboy game. You know what that is? That's sickening. That's sickening. Amen? That's cultish. When you say, I don't want to worship God, I've got to see the Cowboys cook. You got a problem, buddy. And I think we, I think we, th we make God's, not just sports, uh, education, uh, uh, drugs, sex, money, power, all these things. We've chose new gods in this country. I ain't going to preach on that tonight, but I could. They chose new gods. And you know what happened? Then was war in the gates. That's what happened. War comes as soon as you choose new God. And the shield or spear, spear seen among 40,000 of Israel. Now here we go. Look at verse 9. We're going prophetically again. My heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. Speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. Now, what does that remind you of? If we're talking prophetically and sitting on thrones and judging and white asses, we're, we're saying that uh, a, a white donkey in that day was considered like a jaguar today, and a white horse, a stallion, Lord have mercy, that was like a Rolls Royce. And so it could be a picture of when we come back with the Lord. You know what, he told, you know what the Lord told his disciples? He said, when I, when I come, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's verse 10 said that they would sit in judgment and walk by the way. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Uh, all those governors and all those leaders and uh, judging the 12 tribes, and it tells us that we'll judge angels as Christians. We're coming back on white horses, buddy. Amen. Uh, how many, how many seen, they don't do it much anymore, back in the old days, the cowboys and Indians and all those stories. Man, you'd have the, 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 the villain, he'd have the girl, the Indians or somebody would have her, and they would have her bound up and have her on the railroad track, and right at the last minute, the guy on the white horse would ride in and bang, and rescue the girl, knock the villain over the cliff. Every bit of that's Bible. Every bit of that comes right out of that book. That's exactly what's going to happen. The devil's going to have us bone on the ropes. And about that time, Israel, and about that time, the white horse is going to come down and rescue the woman, throw him over in the lay, in the, on the chain gang in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And brother, things are going to change. That's exactly what you're reading about right here. Look at verse number 11. That they are delivered from the noise of archers, strange, a strange uh, figure of speech, noise of archers. Uh, you don't consider people shooting bows and arrows noisy, but they evidently they were hollering and screaming and doing something, the noise of archers. In 1 Samuel 20 and verse 40, it talks about bows and arrows being artillery. 
So it's hard for us to imagine because we fight wars now with just to push a button. Laser beam in on that building over in Iraq, push a button, destroyed. You're sitting in an air-conditioned cockpit somewhere. But back then, they fought them with bows, arrows, rocks, knives, and clubs. And it was just as, it's probably bloodier as it is now or worse. You take, if you took, if you took a hundred men and put them on that wall and a hundred men and put them on that wall and they hated each other and give every one of them a knife or a bow and arrow and said, clash, you'd see some bloodshed in here, buddy. I'm telling you, that'd, that'd mess you up. I mean, one might hit you here, one might hit you there, and nothing go through your neck. Three of them, you're gone. It depends on, one of them probably take you out if it hits you right. So, War was just as bad then. It was just fought on another level. See, if you could have had an atomic bomb then, you could have done some major damage. But the problem is, when they get an airplane, they get an airplane. And they get an atomic bomb, they get an atomic bomb. So, and everybody just keeps getting, now it's nuclear stuff and everybody's got it. And you better hope and pray we don't have another war now. But they are three coming. And I hope they're all after the rapture. I know three are, but I hope we don't have one before the rapture. I hope and pray we don't. There's no telling what we're going to see. So uh, where was it? Verse, verse uh, 11. The noise of the archers and the draw, place of drawing water. I, I don't know what that represents or if it represents anything. There shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord. And it looks like at the end of the tribulation, they're going to be over there singing about how good God's been to them. And his villages in Israel, the people shall go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak. Is it a picture of the Lord Jesus? You don't believe it? And lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. Can anybody tell me where you've heard that phrase before? Leading captivity captive. Anybody know? Where's it at? It's in Ephesians chapter 2, I think. Five, Ephesians 5, where it said when Jesus rose from the grave, he took captivity captive. Barak is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, a type of him. Led in captivity captive. There's another way you know the Bible's the Word of God. Stuff like that clicks. The, that's why they say the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. They're intertwined with each other. You can't understand one without the other. They don't contradict, they complement each other. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, I don't know, you'll probably never hear, you'll never hear the lady or men, Bible teachers on TV, talk about the Lord splashing the blood of his enemies and driving a nail through a guy's head. And the prophet. You'll never hear uh, Joyce Meyer or Marilyn Hickey or Paula White or even... Even the Beth Moore, or Dante, or Joel Osteen, or any any of the prominent, or even Charles Stanley, or even Chuck Swindoll, or any of them talking about. You might hear Stanley, but most of them skip over stories like this. But stories like this are in the Bible to let you know that the Bible is a book of life, and it don't just cover prosperity and peace and healing and relationships. That's all you hear. Prosperity, peace, money, and relationships. Love, love, family, family. Lord knows we need that. But there's a lot more in the Bible beside that. There's prophecy. And prophecy, it's a, it's a book of prophecy. Three-fourths of the Old Testament, a lot of deals with prophecy and has not been fulfilled yet. Look at verse number um, 13. And he made him that remaineth have dominion. See, there it is again. Dominion. That's the millennium. As soon, soon as that war is up, you can't miss it. It's over and over and over. They didn't have dominion over the whole world then. They'd had rest 40 years. It's coming in the future over the nobles of the people. The Lord may be to have dominion over the mighty. Out of Ephraim, verse 14, there was a root against them, against Amalek. Amalek's a picture of the flesh. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, maker, came down governors in Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. Look at that, the pen of the writer. The song we sing, if the pen of the writer write every day. There it shows people that wrote them songs read the Bible. People who write the songs coming out now ain't got much Bible in them, if any. There's one real famous preacher going around right now 
healing everybody and don't even use a Bible. Nobody's ever even seen him with a Bible. I'm telling you, we're getting off track, people. We need to stay the course, stay right on track. Exalt the Savior, evangelize the sinner, and edify the saints. That's what a true Bible ministry is. Them three things. It's not see how many this we can get and how much how many buildings we can build. It's exalt the Savior, evangelize the sinner, and encourage the saint. All right, fifteen. And the prince of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley for the divisions of Reuben. And there were great thoughts of heart. Now here again, it's jumping from now to way out yonder. Now to way out yonder. The Bible does that all the time. Have you ever read that scripture? Where is it, Brother Derek? About uh, uh, Lucifer. Is it Isaiah 28, 14? One of those, you know the scripture about how they're fallen from heaven? Yeah, it's a 14, maybe. I, I might have it. I think it's 14. But anyway, it's like the Lord turned, while he's finding that, the Lord turned to Peter one time and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. And he was talking to Peter's face, to talking to the devil. And the Lord does that a lot. He, he'll say something like, da-da-da, the king of Tyre, the king of Sidon, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Start right into the devil. That's why you're supposed to study. By the way, your King James Bible is the only one that says study too. The new Bible is going to tell you to study. Isaiah 14. And uh, it, he just, he'll skip. He'll skip sometimes. He'll skip the whole church age sometimes and go right from the Old Testament right into the millennium. He'll do that a lot. Study rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't, it don't make no sense and you have to make poetry out of stuff like this. I don't, I don't believe that's right. Matter of fact, I know it ain't. It, it's too convincing. Look at verse 16. Why boatest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flock? Uh, for the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Reuben uh, didn't fight. Reuben didn't, uh, Gilead beyond Jordan abode. Dan remained in ship. Gilead, Dan, and Reuben didn't fight. But Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. Them tribes fought and, and Dan and Reuben and them backed off a little bit. And I guess the Lord will reward them according to their work somehow or another. I don't, and, and that's the, the, the judgment of the nations and the judgment of the 12 tribes of Israel and all that kind of stuff. Verse number 19, the kings, there it is again. And that is uh, uh, the second advent, just like Isaiah 53 is, jumps ahead. The kings, the king came and fought. There was no kings then. There was King Jabin, just one. So when he says the kings came and fought, it's jumping ahead. They fought the kings of Canaan and Tanak by the waters of Megiddo. Does anybody know what that word Megiddo means? What's the word we get from that? Armageddon. That's the battle of Armageddon at the end of the tribulation. You can't avoid it. There's too much. It keeps piling up and piling up. They took no gain of money. Verse 20, you don't believe it? They fought from heaven. The stars, of course, fought against Sisera. So it's jumping back and forth. The heaven, heaven got into this war. You remember Satan was cast down from third heaven to the second heaven, second heaven to the first heaven, then finally from the first heaven all the way to the earth in Revelation, and the wars and the stars, stars in the Bible are represented angels, and, uh, and to the angel of the church and so-and-so, and stars represent angels. Also stars are brightness of the stars represent soul winners in the Bible, and according to Malachi chapter 4, and the stars are shining, and the heavens fight, and I mean, it's a war, brother. Revelation said there was war in heaven. The dragon fought in his angels, and the angels fought back and forth like that. So it's, it's prophetic. You can, you can get a lot out of this if you'll pray and ask the Lord to show you. All right? Where, where'd we get to? Verse number uh, 19, Megiddo. Megiddo. 
Megiddo means the hill of the crowded. That's what that word means, tumult. It's in, it's in uh, Revelation 19. Valley, the battle of Armageddon. End of the tribulation. Not now, not last year, not even next year. The end of the tribulation. The stars fought in the heaven. You see that in Deuteronomy 34, Jude chapter, verse 14. Uh, did you know in Jude that Jude preached on the second advent? Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints before Noah was even born, before the flood, before the corruption of the earth. Jude was preaching the second coming. So you see how that Bible, it's all one unit. It's one book made up of 66 books, not the Apocrypha. There are no missing books of the Bible, y'all. You got every book God wanted you to have. Sometimes you'll meet these critics, and if you ever meet anybody that says this, remember me telling you what to say to them. They'll say, well, the King James Bible originally had the Apocrypha in it. That's a, that's a half truth, which makes it a lie. The King James translators included the Apocrypha. Listen to me. They included the Apocrypha between the Old Testament and New Testament for reading, but noted that it was not a part of the inspired Word of God. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the Greek manuscripts that the new Bibles come from, have the Apocrypha in them. In them. I don't, you know why they won't translate them? Because people in America wouldn't buy them if they had the Apocrypha in them. I ain't going to get off on that, but I'm going to one of these days. All right, verse 21. They fought from heaven. The stars warred. The river of Kishon, remember that river we studied about last time? Swept them away. The ancient river, Kishon. Oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Lord have mercy. Verse 20, 22. Then were the horse hooves broken by the means of prancings, the prances of the mighty ones. I have, I have no idea in this world what that represents. Well, maybe just his, historical. I don't know. Twenty-three, curse ye Meraz, said the angel of the Lord. Meraz was a town, and uh, in history, evidently, didn't help. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof. Why? Because they came not to the help of the Lord, to help of the Lord against the mighty. That means. That's a teaching that you want to make sure you did your part in the fight and you don't want to come up empty-handed at the judgment and say, God, I didn't fight. You know what the Lord's going to do? He's going to require of us how we fought this battle. If you chickened out and didn't stand up for him at work and you're a big chicken because you're afraid you might lose some friends at work or, or your neighbors wouldn't like you no more and you kept back your sword from blood and didn't fight, the Lord's going to say, man, you didn't even fight when you had a chance. You big chicken, what's wrong with you? There'll be a judgment day for that one of these days. It'll be a judgment day. Verse 24, blessed above women. You wonder why the Pope never talks about that. According to that verse, she's ahead of Mary, brother. The Bible didn't say Mary was blessed above women. It said she is blessed among women. Jael was blessed above women. And the Pope never mentions it, or the Catholic priest. The wife of Heber the Kenite, blessed shall be above women in the tent. There's your answer. He asked water, that's, oh, oh, what's his name? Sisera, the Antichrist, and she gave him milk. She brought forth butter in a lordly dish. It says this twice means the same thing. Uh, 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 he asked water. She brought forth milk. She gave him forth butter and a lordly dish. The King James Bible does that a lot. It said milk. She brought him forth butter in a lordly dish. Now that does not mean she brought him a glass of milk and a bowl of butter. It's all the same thing. It's butter, milk. And the new Bibles, you know what they say? Easier to understand. She brought him curds. Is that easier to understand than butter? Uh, all kind of weird stuff like that. It, it, it was probably goat's milk that they had then. And they say that goat's milk is better for you 
than cow's milk. Has anybody ever heard that? If you can hold it on your stomach. I don't know if I can hold it down or not. But it's whatever you get used to. Whatever you train your stomach to like, it'll start liking. You know, I've heard I've heard that if you train your stuff just to eat rice and lentils, stuff like they do in Japan and some of those places, I, that, man, you can smell it cooking. It smells just like a steak to us. You train your taste buds to eat whatever, whatever you know. If, if, uh, <laughs> our, our problem in America, we've trained ourselves to like expensive food. We think if we ain't got a big piece of beef or a big piece of pork or fish that we ain't eating. But a lot of people in the world don't eat meat. Uh, who was it here the other day? Who was it? Who was it? Some missionary. We took him to eat somewhere. I don't know if it was Frenchy, the guy that I led to the Lord from France. He had to go back, by the way. Y'all pray for him. But somewhere they said, we love. Oh, it was the guy at camp. That guy at camp from, uh, uh, from Uganda, I think, he said, I love American food. I love American food. He said, you get meat. He said, you get beef and chicken. We don't get that in my country. But you know, whatever you train your taste buds to like, they'll start liking. She brought him forth butter in a lordly dish. In other words, she, she helped uh, that old guy. And uh, I, I want to say this right quick. It won't take me but a second. She brought him forth milk. She brought him forth butter. Same thing in the context. Butter, milk. Now look, the reason I said that is because sometimes the Bible will say something and it sounds like two different things. Like it'll say, the Lord Jesus Christ and the great God and our Savior. That sounds like two different ones, but he's talking about the same person. Like, it'd be like you saying, there's Brother Danny and our pastor. We don't usually talk like that now, but people used to, old oh, English, it would be, there's Brother Danny and our pastor. Uh, uh, she would say, his wife would say, there's Jimmy and my husband. It's not two different people. It's two titles for the same person. I'll give, you, I'll give you a couple examples of that. So when you're reading your Bible, you won't get confused. Uh, you kill the holy one and the just. And they didn't kill two people. That's all talking about Jesus. So when you read something like the Jehovah Witness tried to tell you that he's the beginning of the creation of God, you need to learn. In other words, this is a sword, and you've got to learn how to hold it or you'll cut yourself. You'll cut yourself with it, double-edged, all right? And, and then uh, let's finish this up right quick. She put her hand to the nail, verse 26. Now, that's, uh, I'd like to hear that verse. She put her hand to the nail, her right hand to the workman's hammer. She got him with the right hand, brother. And with the hammer, she smote Sisera, smote off his head. It didn't tell you that part in verse 4, or chapter 4. After she killed him, I reckon she cut his head off. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through his temples. Now look, if he's a picture of the Antichrist, and she's a picture of Israel, Look at the next verse, 27. At her feet he bowed. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. One of these days the old Antichrist will bow. He fell, he laid down. He, at her feet he bowed, he fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. Leaves you no doubt about it, don't it? He fell down, he bowed, he fell down, he fell down dead. The mother of Sisera looked out at a window. Now this would be the Sisera's mother. This means even wicked men's mother want them to come home from the battle. There's been a many old mother looked out wondering if her, her, her little boy was going to come home. She cried through the lattice. That's a study. That lattice, that's a study. Why is chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise lady answered and said, Yea, she returned to answer herself. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey? To every man a damsel or two, Syria, a di prey of divers colors. Hold your finger there. There's so much in that. You could study that right there all night. So Sir Sisera's mother is saying, why ain't he coming back? Why ain't he coming back? And them wicked women that was around her said, he'll be back. He's just dividing the spoil. He's dividing the spoil. Guess what? He ain't coming back. He's dead. He's dead. And, he's, and, and looking through that lattice is in the Song of Solomon over there. I got it marked here. I got the note here somewhere, I think. And uh, uh, in the Song of Solomon, and Psalm 68, 
at the second coming, it'll be like the Lord looks through the lattice and we'll see somebody at the end of the tribulation will get a glimpse of him. Bam, here he comes through the lattice. Study that when you get home. Study that through the lattice. Psalm 68, Song of Solomon chapter 2, and it's, it's uh, at the second advent. He bowed and fell down and got a coat or a, a prey of divers colors, a prey of divers covers of needlework, needlework on both sides, got blankets and coats and stuff. Why is that significant? Because all your new Bibles don't say Joseph had a coat of many colors. None of them do. None of the new Bibles say Joseph. You know Joseph, his coat of many colors. Dolly Parton sings about it. Preachers preach about it. They say, nope, that's wrong. Them other Greek manuscripts don't say colors. It says pieces, coat of many pieces. Guess what your King James says? Coat of many colors. You say, well, couldn't, couldn't, uh, is the King James wrong? No. It is a coat of many pieces, and every piece is a different color. See why you'd have a problem with that. If your King James is right, the new ones are wrong. And right there it says, prey of divers colors. They say, well, everybody wore the same color back then. That right there says they didn't. They called the prey of divers colors, diverse, different colors. All right? Verse 31, so let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him. Oh, my goodness, be as the sun. As the sun, when he goeth forth in his might. And look what happens. The land had rest. Millennium. The sun that goes forth in his might. You want any plainer than that? If that ain't prophecy, my name ain't Brother Danny. Listen, people. Everybody who preaches on prophecy, Malachi chapter 4 says, when the Lord comes back at the advent, there'll be as the sun. Matthew 13, as the sun. The sun goeth forth in his might. Psalm 19 says that the verse will be like the sun. We're as the sun after rain. When the Lord comes back, we'll shine as the sun. Got it? That's a prophecy. That song is a whole prophetic psalm. It's not just poetry. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, that would be one of our little bit more deeper studies in the book of Judges. Come back next week. We'll get to more practical stuff next time. All right?